slowly. We'll give everybody a minute. Okay. It's taking longer to brew the coffee. No worries. So before we go to the slide deck, though, Isaac, do you want to do? The, do you want me to do the screen share of what we've been doing for everybody, just so that you guys are all aware? While you've been ch chatting in the background, what we've been doing for you is creating a map for you about what you say collective impact is like, what some of the insights are that you've shared around the common agenda. And we'll keep doing this through the session. So much like at the end of last session, you'll have a nice record of the different comments to go along. So there you go. Thank you. Thank you. All right. You're ready to switch gears now, and let's talk about um, data and shared measurement, which is the second of the five conditions of collective impact. Let's jump over that, just a reminder, right? Okay, on to the next, okay, jump right over this one too. So let's start at the very beginning with regrounding and what do we, what, how does shared measurement get defined in the context of collective impact? And what it is important to realize is that Data is used to help inform your common agenda at the beginning. And then it also is used um, as key measures that you all agree to, to track your progress related to that common agenda as well, okay? But the data is always connected to the common agenda, both to shape it and also to track progress. Um, the most, and then, as well, when you think about this condition, it isn't just having those measures um, that you've all agreed to and that you're monitoring. It's important that you've established some systems for regularly gathering that data and pulling people together to make sense of it. So collecting the data is only half the work and it's probably the less impactful half of that work because really what you really want to make sure, uh, because remember, you're trying to prototype something new. It's not like you are taking a, a pre-designed initiative and plugging it in. So if you're not monitoring and tracking how it's playing out on the ground, you won't know when you need to tweak it. You won't know what's really working well, and you won't be able to celebrate the progress. Do you remember that story in Erie, how powerful it was when they were able to share to their community what a huge shift they'd made? And that's one metric, right? But it doesn't have to be a huge laundry list. If you go to the next slide. So I shared, I referred to this um, mature collective impact initiative from Ontario that did actually decide in their region that their ultimate goal was having all children thrive. So they start with that as their common agenda. Then they worked backwards and they had a conversation which said, well, if all children in our region were thriving, how would we know? What would we be seeing? And they came up with that second box, which they called the Halton 7, because they live in Halton. Pretty, pretty clean, right? Children are healthy, children are learning, children are positively connected, children are safe, families are strong and stable, schools are connected to the community, and neighborhoods are where we live, work, play. And then they said, okay, if those are the big um, markers that we're tracking to enable us to feel confident we're, you know, creating a community where all children thrive, what data points currently exist that we could use as indicators that we were on the right track with respect to these seven. And then they started documenting the resources and programs that already existed so that they could figure out where their value added contribution as a collaborative could be. If we go to the next slide, they've now subsequently really matured this to the point that they have a shared data portal. So any organization in the community can plug its own data in and drill stuff down to the neighborhood level in terms of different issues, all connected and driven off the Halton 7. And interestingly, they now also do their own surveying. So every two years, I think they survey all seven, grade seven to grade 12 students. And so they have a youth survey input and that data gets folded in as well. So I'd encourage you to check it out. That's sort of where this stuff can ultimately evolve to. Go to the next slide, please. So let's be honest though, with data, one of the big challenges is that often people struggle to agree on a reasonable, manageable set of indicators. And often it's because they work backwards. 
So they gather up all the possible data that they have across these different partners and then try to figure out which pieces they should use, right? Instead, it's better in some ways to say, okay, what is our common agenda? What is the thing we're trying to achieve? And then like Halton, what are the measures and metrics, you know, the, that would allow us to feel confident we were moving in the right direction? Okay, so now what data points best suit um, what we're trying to achieve? One of the best strategies I've heard around this as well um, is that um, around the limited capacity, which is the third challenge there, every community, every organization usually has an epidemiologist or a data person. So the leadership table can just convene those experts, say, we're not experts, we don't know. And often different organizations' data is like an apple to an orange. You guys know. You know what we're trying to achieve. Can you look at all the data that you have regular, reliable access to and come back with a set of recommendations for us in terms of what we should use? One of the other challenges though, and this is real, remember Paul's talking about turf and trust? Too often data is used um, to evaluate and or punish, um, you know, or say this group is better than that group. And so people are often reluctant to share their data because they are concerned that they will be judged poorly and or seen as lesser than another organization because they don't have the same results. But frankly, they could be working with a very different population. So it's actually not fair, but regardless, people are resistant. Um, sometimes funders also have different data requirements, different reporting requirements. And so some of it is about, you don't wanna overwhelm people where suddenly they're having to report on all these different metrics for all these different stakeholders. Um, and I think the other thing is that time and cost is often, um, it's a barrier or people think that they have to design a catalog date, Cadillac data system right from the beginning. And often you don't, right? Okay. If we go to the next one. So here's a really lovely approach um, for using and testing data in the early stages of your collective impact initiative, when you are trying to build consensus around your common agenda. And so it's another way to have those holistic uh, structured conversations that actually explore an issue from multiple perspectives. If you can go to the next slide, I'll walk you through the process. So what is it? It's a powerful process that in, gives um, data points to diverse tables of stakeholders and invites them to have a conversation which shares what is this data telling us. It, it was created by the Urban Institute. And what's lovely about it is two things. One, it invites these diverse stakeholders into the complexity of the issue that you know is there, right? And so it, it helps them better understand and avoid that knee-jerk reaction. Well, why don't you just give them all books? You know, if we want every child to, you know, to thrive in Singapore, let's just all give them books and they'll read and they'll be smart and life will be good. What you want people to understand is the multiple dimensions that are at play here and understand the competing perspectives. On to the next page. So when, how, when do you use a data walk? It's really great if you want to build knowledge and data capacity around, amongst different stakeholders. It's a beautiful way to engage and empower the knowledge of residents. Um, it's a fabulous structured way to encourage small group conversation between people who wouldn't normally speak to one another. And it does help avoid that quick fix. Oh, let's just throw this band-aid at it. Let's just do that. Okay, on to the next. So if you're going to do one of these, right, you got to be really clear, which is like one of the other groups said, what is the goal of using this data walk? What's the intention and in being able to be upfront with participants about that? You want to make sure that you have those diverse perspectives all in the same room together. And if you're putting people into small dialogue groups, you want to have that, that a microcosm of that diversity in each small group to the best you can. You know, you really want to give people some ground rules to encourage them to facilitate their conversation well. Um, 
give thought to like we've done these virtually but you can also do them in person and really making sure you've got adequate space for groups to move through um there is a challenge around strategically deciding which data points you want to profile um and here's the thing anyone that's had any kind of background in academic research this is going to hurt because you got to ex escape that need to be totally thorough and objective in a data walk, you have six, maybe eight stations in total. You want to cherry pick key data points that you know are pivotal and be unapologetic about that, like areas where you have a sense that some real strategic work needs to happen. Um, and then the second component, once you've got the data in place, you want to be posing to people a thought provoking question that gets them underneath the symptom and starts thinking about the root cause. Does that make sense? So I'll show you. If we go to the next one. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to run through this quickly, but people only get six, 10 minutes at each station to look at it, catch some initial thoughts, then go to the next one, then to the next one. No more than six stations. So it's not huge. But then at the end, you give them in their small group time to make sense of the whole of what they've seen and heard, because they're getting little vignettes of perspectives on the same issue. Go to the next slide. Uh, nope, next one, I think. Oh, no, this is it. Go back one. The only thing you want to also keep in mind is it's helpful to offer context. So if you were kind of um, showing data about, you know, the southern half of Singapore only, you want to be able to say, and this is how we vary from the country as a whole. Like we're better, we're stronger, we're weaker, whatever. Um, and um, you can also invite people to have a parking lot because if other issues come up and you don't want to get sidetracked, you just keep moving them over. Okay, on to the next. I want to walk you through an example of what this looks like. Um, when we set the context, we're very explicit with people. This is not going to be a comprehensive data view of every element or dimension of the issue. We are choosing a handful to keep us focused, and it only reflects, like data is always changing, so it reflects the most current information that we have. If you go to the next one. Um, all right. So here's an example. I'm going to give you a real life example of a data walk that we hosted. So it was a data walk to launch um, interest in a poverty reduction strategy in a community. Okay. So the group convening it was really clear. They had a common agenda and a goal that they wanted to see 2,100 individuals or families moved out of poverty and on a pathway to stability. They had already, as a group, identified the three core levers to get there, income security, economic mobility, and social inclusion. And the reason that you're all being invited to come to this data walk today is we want to inform you about how, what poverty looks like in our region and get your ideas and input around how we can work together to address it. We want to educate and inform participants about our initiative and our collaborate, our collective impact work to reduce poverty. And we want to use this as an opportunity to engage you and see if you want to join in this effort. Okay, if we go to the next slide. So here's the first slide that we walked people to. Station one, they've got themselves in dark green as their community. The lines across are poverty levels, right? In different, like in the in the state where they're based, but also the neighboring state, and how the other counties in their community line up with them. So obviously, you know, they're not they're not the ones with the highest level of poverty, but they're not the lowest either. Okay. And then what we do is people in their small group can catch some initial reactions to this data. And then we say, and this is the thought provoking question, how do we think poverty would impact the sustainability and viability of us as a community? Right, so we're already starting to shift people to think beyond we have to fix these people to wow, this is a problem that we as a community ought to deal with. On to the next. 
So this is one where they broke who's poor in our community and divided it by race, okay? So you can see very clearly, uh, they've listed African-Americans, Hispanics, and whites. So you can see the ones who are not in poverty and the percentage of the community members of this race that are in poverty. And so the provoking question we want them to spend a few minutes thinking about is how might the issue of race affect how we would design a poverty reduction effort? Like what, what do we need to think about? What do we need to know? On to the next one. This is really interesting. So they talk about the fact that poverty can have long-term impacts beyond the immediate economic realities. And that in truth, a lot of income support programs actually have unintended negative consequences because they cut you off once you get your income above a certain level, but it's not enough to replace what they're losing, right? And then there's also the fact that only 4% of people who are born in poverty actually get out of poverty in the case of this community. Okay. And so they demonstrate both of these things. And then they say, how might a community poverty reduction strategy ad address not just um, the immediate, but also the long-term and generational impacts of poverty as we think about this work? Okay, on to the next. So then what we did, so they've all, everyone's gone around. You've all seen these stations. Then we sit you, we give you 15, 20 minutes, and we'll say, remember, the goal of our community's poverty reduction effort is to achieve these uh, objectives. And what now would you see, based on what the conversations you've been having and the data that you've seen, what would you see as some of the barriers that will get in, that will prevent us from reaching this goal? What would you see as some of the enablers or supports that can actually, we can build upon? And so this is, again, just getting people to climb into your issue. On to the next. Um, and then after they had shared their ideas and different people had reported out what they thought, what they'd learned, what they were now thinking about that they hadn't given thought to before, we asked them. So there's different levels at which we were going we're gonna to need continued contribution and participation from people. You can choose to be right there, committed and part of our leadership table. You can be highly involved. So we can consult you regularly. You could be an advisor and or a source of input. Um, or, you know, you can be supportive. So once a year, we'll convene you and we'll give you an update on how we're doing. Or finally, you know, you can say, just put me on your mailing list. I don't need to come to any more events. I'm fine. Right. So they are telling you. And that will give you some beautiful input around who else you might want to engage and whose heart have you touched just by being part of one conversation. And then we also give them an opportunity to say, who else do you think we should talk to from these different sectors? Okay, so if you go to the next slide, um, this is just some high level data for you. Okay, so um, they had 63 people at their virtual session. It took two and a half hours because they did other things at the beginning to talk about the initiative as a whole. They had eight groups of eight. There were six data stations and 74% of the people there in the room said they wanted to be involved to some degree or other moving forward. If you go to the next slide. Um, we also at the very end said one word in the chat box to kind of summarize how you've, you know, your response to, or how you're feeling about this experience and what you've learned. And there you'll see people were deeply moved. And it's a, just an affirmation of all the things that Paul's saying. You put people into the issue. You put people into the problem. You don't feel this pressure to come to them with this perfect answer, right? And through these conversations and through these experiences, that's how you build not only innovative and insightful perspectives, but you're also bringing people along with you at the same time. Does that make sense? Okay. So just in the slide deck, just so you know it's here, if you wanna dig deeper into data walks and or thinking about how you might use data to shape a conversation about an issue you care about, bunch of stuff there for you to dig into. And if you go to the next slide, I'm just gonna ask for a couple of moments of questions.
before I put you into a dialogue about data in your work. Any thoughts, ideas? It, it can be a comment, question, insight. All right, well, maybe you'll have some after you've had a little bit of time to go into your small groups and really think about how you could use this. So if you go to the next slide, Isaac, we're gonna put you back into your same small groups. And what we're gonna ask you to do, you're gonna have 15 minutes, Part one, what data do you already know exists to help inform your common agenda? And um, that's what I would be curious about. So what data do you already have that you could use to help inform? All right, off you go. Small groups, 15 minutes. See what you got. So who had a really cool insight from your conversation that you can share with all of us? No insights. You need just uh, okay. I know I talked already, but um, I guess one of the like points that we were kind of thinking about was um, in Singapore, it's always a really big thing that a lot of data comes from overseas. And then one thing that we were thinking about was like, does our specific audience even care whether it's overseas or not? And like that whole conversation. Well, when you say comes from overseas, is it is data that reflects data from- a lot of like but is, research on child development specifically. So you don't have population like data about how many children, where are they, what, how would they be? It's more about um, data on like how play affects child development on like education strategies and how that affects child development. But here's my question to you. What do you know? It might even be demographic data right? Um, About how, like, how many primary school age children, how many preschool age children do we know? How many of them, you know, what's the first language of many of them? How many uh, live in poverty? Like, anything like that. Like, you need to understand, right, the different subpopulations of children in Singapore, because if you want to promote play as a really important developmental um, investment, you need to know and understand how it can impact all these different subgroups, right? Another thing you need to, that in, in another way that data could be helpful for you, because the scope of your collective impact initiative, there's always this challenge, right? Like Erie Together, you want to achieve these great things for the entire community. And then at the same time, you've got to focus, right? To get momentum on key issues. If you knew, for example, that, I don't know, children living in the Northwest part of the country are more vulnerable than the rest of the community, that might say, well, maybe we'll start working here right? Or maybe there's, you know, I don't know what it is, but it's a way to help you kind of segment where you might want to start. Ultimately, you hope to serve everyone, but you're not necessarily going to start there. So it is about development, but it isn't as, you know, but it's also about quantitatively, who do we know? How many kids are we talking about? How many preschoolers actually are still at home and don't go to a formal preschool? I don't know, right? So it's that kind of thing. Anything that can help you better understand the audience you want to serve. Anybody else? Thoughts, ideas, insights? Charlotte, did you have something? Sorry, I was taking notes. Um, <laughs> um, uh, I wanted to say that actually all of us have a lot of existing data through our work. And, and we talked about consolidating the data and organizing a system to which um, key points of the of what we need to know are highlighted because we have a lot of 
there's a lot of data from not just from foreign data, but from right. our work. There's a lot of data that exists in our work, our own work over the last you know years. So it's right. about con it's about bringing that up and con having a system to consolidate it. Yeah, it is. But my advice to you as well is also narrow, like don't overwhelm yourself with this other whole task that you have to get all this data organized before you can come up with a common agenda. It could be a both and, right? It's informed by, but then you focus on the data that best supports what you're hoping to achieve as well. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I think what I'm hearing, Sylvia, is that don't focus on the data that proves our solution. Focus on the data that is looking at the sector where it is and what yeah. needs to be done, right? Yeah. So it's not about data that, oh, so what we have done about play or about educational strategies are working, it's more of where, where are the children now? You know, like how many are, how many are considered thriving? What goes into thriving or, yes, you know, yes. where are the lowest income? Yeah, I get it. Yes. Yeah. The, because then there's other things that other partners could also contribute to that bigger yeah. goal, right? Um, the other thing I would say is qualitative data can be just as powerful as quantitative data. So if you had a survey of parents, for example, and there were some really powerful quotes that summarized some really important themes coming from that data, you could have, you know, some, you could have the theme and then you could have a couple of quotes from parents to illustrate what people mean when they talk about this. And it's a nice counterpoint to the data. Right, you need the quantitative, but you also need the qualitative. So don't shy away from using that if you have it as well. Anybody else? One final comment, question about data before I send you off on a break. Or question. Hi, sorry, I have a question. Sure, go ahead. Sorry, here. Hi. Um, I'm just wondering how how would you propose in in sort of concrete action steps within the group who is is meant to gather that data and organize it and sort of present it um, and then do you have to make sort of people agree on the format that they because there's you know a whole way of how you gather data and how you then show it so how as a group are you supposed to do that do you gather data from each organization do you then sort of just determine a methodology for everyone? Um, do you have an external partner deal with that, you know, because it's their job, like just in the practicalities of it? Uh, yeah, you. I think in the early stage, when you're just beginning to form your common agenda, right? You get your different multi-sector partners and you say, I know we all want to do something around um, migrant workers. So what data already exists that tells us more about the realities of migrant workers in Singapore. Who has what? So that data is really important, right? Because it helps us to identify key issues or subpopulations or different geographic areas of the country where there might be um, a case made that we want to start here, okay? So that's, that's at the startup. And then we start discussing the issues. We start learning more. We start saying, well, we don't have any data about this. Okay. So when we get clear, understanding like if, if the data helps paint part of the picture, the existing programs and services that we have already in place and who they serve is another kind of assessment of where is our starting point. When we start convening around the, the common agenda starts to kind of take shape, right? This is the aspiration. This is what we want to achieve together, right? Then what we say when people are crystallized around that, we say, okay, so what are the data points that we're collectively going to agree we will regularly check in on to let us know, A, whether our collective impact initiative is having the kind of result, generating the kind of results that we want. And it could also say, well, we've been working away um, 
on addressing this issue around migrant workers. We've made great progress, but all of a sudden, there's this huge, massive influx of new migrant workers. So the migrant worker population has tripled, right? So it looks like we're not making progress, but in fact, we're making tremendous progress given, uh, and what's shifted is the total population. So it's important to really know because it helps you both understand what impact your collective work is having, but also how the issue itself may be shifting and changing as well. And that might also call you and your collective to say, maybe we need to, you know, think about doing something beyond what we're already doing or, you know, put an energy and attention to this emerging issue and maybe less attention on an issue that we're trying to get moving, but doesn't seem to be getting a lot of traction. Make sense? Okay. This is how it is not a strategic plan, right? Because it's very dynamic. How about we go take a break? <laughs>